hello hello and welcome to this month's featured pattern designer um so this is the featured designer of may we are talking with mika of salt and stone knits squeezing it in right at the end of the month and i see that she is here so i will invite her if i can remember how to do it um so yes uh, i like to do every month feature a designer to come on and talk about designing stuff and life beyond designing i'm so excited you're here Mika. hey how's it going thank you so much for having me yeah no problem i'm so excited um <laughs> Yeah, so if folks don't know us yet, <laughs> hello and welcome. Uh, I am Jessica, the knitting pattern designer behind Snickerdoodle Knits and the facilitator behind the design circle. And Mika, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mika John of Salt and Stone Knits, and I'm a knitwear designer and teacher. And yeah, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks again for having me. Yes. It's nice to sure. chat. I see some familiar faces also in the in joining us here. <laughs> yes, so fun. So if you're joining us live, hello, welcome. We're so excited you're here. Feel free to chat with us in in the chat. Um, that always makes it fun just to, to have a little more interaction that way. It always is like one of those things where you wish you could like actually see everybody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Zoom is the way we do that, but it's so much more convenient to do it on social media. So anyways. Well, at least it's nice to have a conversation like this because you're talking to somebody at least. But when you're on a live by yourself, I always have those times where my face is reading the comments. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Social media is always the most attractive, you know, <laughs> viewpoint of us, but <laughs> uh, that's good. Reality is good, too. Um, sure. So what is your, your elevator pitch that you would say about what you create with Salt and Stone Knits? Oh, that's tricky. That's actually on the to-do list to kind of like <laughs> tighten up and get like a tight two on, on my, on the, on what I do. Um, well... Um, yeah, I'm a, I am a, originally from New York, so a New Yorker, uh, living in Amsterdam, uh, creating knitwear designs and teaching. I say that, you know, salt and stone, it's actually kind of, um, grounded in, so kind of like stone, it's ground, my work is grounded in technique and enhanced with texture. So that was also kind of a play of salt and stone, uh, thanks to the work of, uh, Catherine, who, uh, I was working with to kind of uh come up with a little bit of tagline and, and she came up with this brilliant idea about uh combining technique and teaching with the texture that i love um so yeah i'd say let's let's if you wrap it up <laughs> yeah i love that that's so fun um so maybe since you've already kind of talked a little bit about what salt stone is about do you want to talk about how you got started designing um, how that whole process went, how long you've been designing, all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I learned to knit probably like many of you when I was younger, but I, I learned to knit from my mother and excuse me. Um, I learned to knit from my, from my mother but she kind of taught me and then that was that was it we didn't really discuss it much afterwards and we were just kind of like a lone i was just like a lone knitter i had a project here a project there and um didn't really didn't really go past what my interest was at the time so i didn't really have much to inspire me um i had a little bit of a a, a knitting business when i was in high school like i could knit a, a hat in a period so people would throw their their <laughs> their request at the beginning of the period and that I knit and then I have a hat but past that it was pretty much uh it was pretty much just on my own so it wasn't until I had moved to the Netherlands in 2017 to be with my my boyfriend my now fiance that I was packing my two giant suitcases and I was like okay I'm gonna have a lot of time to myself not really gonna know super a lot of people so it'll be nice to have some crafts in there and i was just trying to figure out which ones were going to fit so last minute i 
packed everything I needed and then jammed some yarn in like the crevices, sprinkled some needles in there and some hooks. And then I came to the Netherlands. Um, the first thing I started doing was crocheting actually and really enjoyed that. I had learned crocheting from a uh, Our Lady of Snow uh, in Brooklyn, in Greenpoint, uh, women who were um, creating blankets and hats and scarves for, for homeless shelters. So they had taught me how to crochet and I picked it up um, or continued to do it when I moved here. And then I was like, well, maybe in the Netherlands there are some knitters and crafters that you know I can kind of relate with. I had no, no idea at all <laughs> what I was walking into. So kind of the, the incredible designers, yarn shops, uh, dyers, uh, everything here, history of knitting here. Um, when I finally mustered up the energy to go to a craft night, I went to my local yarn shop, which was uh, Stephen, it's just, which is Stephen, Penem Stephen and Penelope. And it was a bit intimidating. A lot of people were speaking Dutch. I didn't speak Dutch at the time. And, you know, I was also coming in with like just a little project and everyone had these gorgeous sweaters and everything. And it took a few tries and a few months in between for me to actually get comfortable. But one day I went in totally in my groove, excited to see my friends, super inspired by everything, what everything what people were making. And I decided to take on my first sweater made my first sweater and I was like oh maybe this designing thing seems kind of cool you know uh well we'll see how it goes I really I come from a family of serial entrepreneurs so it's always you know jumping from business to business and also just kind of talking around the dinner table about how we can dive into this industry and make it into a business or you know what kind of licensing would you need or what kind of you know how would you reach their audience like kind of more like step-by-step -step things, uh, how to get there. So I always wanted my own business. I just didn't know what industry it would be in. So when this idea of knitwear design came into play and I had such an incredible support group from my, um, from my, my crafting, uh, from my craft night, I was like, all right, let's give it a try. I sat down with my, my, uh, with Gosper and we did an assessment of the landscape. We were just like, okay, what are the advantages that I have? What are the disadvantages that I have? How can I overcome them? And you know, at what point can I start building a team to, to compensate for it as well? And you know, what's the strategy here? And we gave a timeline of a year to see how it went. And after a year, I had released one pattern and Vogue Knitting had actually reached out to me to start teaching. So we decided it was trending upwards. I'm very excited for that. Um, and just kind of went from there. It's been, I can't believe it's been three years since I released my first pattern. Actually today, today's the three year anniversary. I reached and released Chickpea, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy, crazy ride since then. So yeah, most of my work is in designing and then transferred in, or, at first it was designing and then it got into, into teaching and I just discovered I love teaching. Yeah. So yeah. And then most recently I just uh, uh, did Knit Stars. Yeah. Also a huge surprise. <laughs> crazy, crazy. You never know who's watching or where your name's being mentioned. And that's how I felt with both Vogue and Knit Stars. It just came out of nowhere and super, super grateful for people that were watching and mentioned my name. Yeah, I love that so much. Okay, I have like a million different aspects that I want to talk about so <laughs> if I remember them all but maybe starting chronologically um as a kid so you learned how to knit and stuff did you do a lot of other crafty hobby kind of stuff I think uh, I painted a bit I was drawing I you know was in you know AP art growing up or, or like in in high school <laughs> I don't know what I did but um <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I did enjoy I did enjoy kind of crafting and, and more creative stuff, but I would have never called myself creative. That's for sure. Yes, uh, yes, I can totally relate. I uh, I actually I was on a podcast in April, I think it was uh, the Feel Good Social podcast, and we ended up going on a whole tangent talking about 
creativity, but I never thought I was artistic or creative or any of that. And we kind of talked about like where that stemmed from, um, you know, like elementary art school. <laughs> mm. <laughs> when I was like told that my work wasn't great and all of this stuff. And I'm like, but I tried so hard. On anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but I, yeah, I totally thought that I wasn't creative or artistic. I loved hobby stuff. I loved sewing and things like that. Um, but to me, if that wasn't creative, that was just following somebody else's idea. <laughs> yeah. It's and then, true. Yeah. So I anyway, did remember I think, kind of like trying to sew my own bags with my mom or, I mean, everyone in my family is really creative um, in a lot of ways too. And yeah, it's, it, I think it's also relatively speaking, I also felt like, oh yeah, you know, it's not, I can't do that. Um, yeah. So <laughs> there's also, there's also a bit of that as well. And I felt like, I have this romantic idea of how creativity kind of happens for other people that it just kind of like flows from their fingers and it's this, the, the air they breathe almost. And compared to that, my idea seems super Hi, Prue. <laughs> uh, I, I saw the, I think that compared to that, my idea seems super clinical and structured and a little more, a bit more, yeah manufactured in a way yeah. than this like oh the the sun was just beaming through the through the window and fell so lightly through the air and i thought of this beautiful painting i was like okay that would never happen to me or like some people who smell yarn and they're like these need to be mittens so i was like that's 100 percent not me <laughs> so maybe it's also yeah. a bit of a skewed romantic idea on uh what it what it is for other people yeah. And also, I think linked to that is also your definition of artistic. Um, like for me, like, I always think of artistic as like painting and drawing. And I always say I can't even draw a stick figure. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it's, it's kind of the same idea where it's like, it's just like this assumption that it just comes naturally. And it's like easy. And it's like, the pen just creates what it wants. And I'm like, I can't get this thing to do what it wants. What I yeah. Want. Um, and I have a little cousin who, who's amazing at, I guess he's not so little now. He's graduating this year from high school. But, um, he, he's amazing at like sketching and stuff. At one time he was like, you know, it's like, I practice this like hours every day. It's not that this is, this is easy. And so I think it's just like a lot of misconceptions that mm -hmm. it's society have around talent and art and creativity and all of those different things that right. that make us feel less than or, or not good. Yeah. Enough. And also a bit of the kind of the highlight reel, right? The idea of mm -hmm. social media that kind of brings up the top of the top and you think people are just, you know, doing that in their sleep. But even even before social media, the idea that, you know, you put your best foot forward and you think that you don't see it's not so much about what you do see, but what you don't see is mm -hmm. so many scribbles, so many things that don't, you know, that uh, that the person doesn't feel comfortable with, or all the steps that it takes to build up to that point. So, I think I've I think I've I've slowly adjusted to the idea of calling myself creative in my own way and finding my medium and being a bit uh, uh, more comfortable with the term. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. say artist. I'm still not going to go there. But I... <laughs> I feel like we are, we're so similar. Do you have more of a, like, do you have a mathematic background or like, are you into that kind of stuff with your structure or anything? So when I was mentioning advantages and disadvantages, disadvantages is I can barely do simple math. So you can imagine what, what, what a special kind of hell it is to grade a sweater for me. Oh, you're so sweet, bro. <laughs> um, and <laughs> thank you. But, uh, also it's five 30 in the morning where she is in Australia right now, which is oh, crazy. <laughs> uh, good morning. And, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so one of the disadvantages was definitely math for me. I can do it if I sit there long enough, but it's, I, it's gotten to some sweaters when I was like, I'd sooner gouge my eyes out before I do <laughs> this. I had to really step away. So math for me is not really a, 
not the way my brain works. Um, science, and I guess that was kind of like my my specialty. But whereas it comes to to knitwear design, it's kind of all the other hats you have to wear, right? The kind of the people skills or the 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 streamlining processes. Oh man, that that's exciting. <laughs> so the 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 organization the kind of putting all the pieces together the kind of angling and positioning to grow your business and to figure out what where you want to go and how you're going to position yourself to get there and kind of jumping from mm -hmm. from place to place and every once in a while you get also surprised too um curveballs <laughs> yes um yeah so you mentioned like your family is very much entrepreneurial did your are like both of your parents entrepreneurs and you just like grew up with all of that conversation around you and everything yeah my parents they owned um a flower shop when I was growing up and and my father especially he uh yeah every five to ten years has a different business uh, <laughs> or a new or it's like starting a new one and in completely different industries as well um my sister has a has her own business and uh, well manages all the businesses and then also she creates she's creating her own right now which is really awesome. My brother has his own business. He's a metal fabricator. Um, and my mom initially, she, uh, she studied as a fashion designer. So also, you know, creative in her own right. So it's also, yeah, it's very encouraging that everyone's kind of all mm -hmm. over the place and has mm -hmm. no hesitation of just taking a sharp left turn and going <laughs> somewhere completely different. Uh, so it, it is quite encouraging that I have that kind of background. No one's like, oh, you know, you can't do that or, or what are you thinking or whatever. It's kind of like, oh, so what are you going to do next? And how are you going to get there? Or like kind of think along with you, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Yeah. Also, um, my, my fiance is exactly the same. So he also has <laughs> his own business. We have our little strategy sessions at night, like over wine. We're like, okay, so then we're going to do this. And, you know, uh, very much so. Um, a good overview and partner in crime and trying to to figure out the business sides of a new industry. Yeah, I'm thinking I need to come back to Amsterdam and just hang out and talk to <laughs> Yeah, how was your trip? Oh, it was so good. Very tiring. I mean, it was chaotic and <laughs> I'm still okay. definitely like trying to figure out my sleep schedule and my life in general you know, <laughs> around and stuff like How that function in normal life again. And congratulations on in tandem too <laughs> thank you yes that's yes. really so, <clears throat> yeah so for folks that don't know i just got back from vacation two and a half weeks in europe and the second city we were in was amsterdam i absolutely loved it so i was that's going great. to ask you you know about that whole like <clears throat> excuse me you moved to Amsterdam and it was this new place and um, how did that whole transition go for you like it was kind of it was very much intertwined with this whole journey of becoming a designer as well yeah I was actually I completely switched industries when I had moved to Amsterdam as well um I became a user experience designer and um I was starting off with a, a learning development and, and design at the same time, trying to see kind of where I wanted to take things. And this was right before I moved and was learning both to see what kind of I gravitated towards. Also, it's helpful, you know, to, to have an understanding of both when you're working. And then kind of from there, went to see what doors opened up a little bit easier and I happened to go for design. So I built up my own, uh, built up my portfolio in a couple of months, just, you know, giving myself exercises, trying to see what was out there and what, what qualified for, for getting a position. And then um, within a few months, or I'd say like maybe, yeah, five, six months or so, I was working on that and got here, connected with a friend and worked for Vodafone as a, as a senior rex designer. Um, I was on like a little team person, then I kind of moved up. And I was, that was my first dip into corporate realm which was very strange and also very exciting because like my first time in uh, actually kind of having friends of my own in the Netherlands because all of my other friends had been through CASA and there was a first group of people that I had introduced <laughs> to him that he didn't know. So um, <laughs> it was definitely mixed into this whole kind of trend. That was like the biggest part of my transition. And then 
I realized that corporate wasn't so much for me and I kind of wanted to do my own thing and I was taking my Dutch exams. So I was like, okay, I have some time. Also just take some time away and my project had finished. So I was playing around with the idea, you know, like when you have your work and during the lunch break, you're like the, the crochet hook and the yarn is sneaking out of your bag and you're just like, hmm. And the more and more you think about it, I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe this is, this is something that's, in, that's important. Um, and uh, I'm just reading the question here. I will go back to that in just a second. And let's see. Yeah, so that was a big part of like mixing in with my, my initial move here. And then I kind of went into into the knitting. So uh, I, when I had first moved, oh, yeah, I was mainly focusing on on user experience design. And then and then I kind of got into like a year and a half later or something like that. And then it was like, a, all right, let's see if this actually works out with the knitting. And then we set the clock. Um, <laughs> so Prue had asked, have where? Let me scroll. Oh, have you brought any of that learning design experience, uh, user experience design? into your online and uh, F to F with knitting. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so have you, she asked, uh, have you brought any of that learning or design experience into your online and face to face with knitting? Right. Um, yeah. So that was one of the biggest pain points that I had when I first started knitting designs was the patterns some of them or few that I had like had encountered in from a user experience perspective were just yeah we're, we're just <laughs> leaving one to to maybe uh oh, not at all Brew, don't worry and also autocorrect is just <laughs> is, is there to get you um the the user experience design of, of, of patterns was really tough. And I was thinking like, okay, how can we visually actually approach this? And that was my first um, look at it. That's where I thought I had my advantage, you know, where I could be like, okay, these can be clearly written patterns in like for all different kinds of people for learning, right? Some of them also make some assumptions to say, oh, this is how it's done or this is how it's always been done. So it should be like this. And so I like to write really thorough patterns because of that and work with an incredible pattern writer and grader who also feels that way. And uh, Olga, hey, P. And um, she also kind of wants to deliver that quality and, and make it af available for everybody. So if you like to do toe up socks or cuff down, you don't have to choose. It's in the same pattern, stuff like that. So just making it more accessible to other people and having um, step by step everything that needs to be there. So you have something to lean on if you are a newer person at knitting, like I was in the beginning, or you have, you know, you have everything you need and you can kind of skip over it. <laughs> I mean, they're not 17 page patterns still, but you know, at least they are um, what I feel is a good amount of support. So that's one of the biggest things. And then visually speaking, um, in terms of like high tech, hierarchy text, and uh, the hierarchy of the text to be able to visually piece things out and put things together and already subconsciously work through the pattern a little bit more. Um, that's something that I like to focus on as well. And as well as, hey, if you are printing out the pattern, none of the pictures are on the pages that are, are need to be printed out. So you're not worried about, oh, I don't want to waste all this ink, but then I kind of need that page. And so it's specifically designed to put all of the text in one section. So stuff like that. I think when I first had started, I wanted to be, I was a lot more ambitious with my ideas of how to, to customize a user experience. But I think it also makes sense that over time it was kind of like, oh, that's that's maybe not needed or people can kind of find their way around that or have their own solutions to things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a great question, Prue. Thanks. Yeah, that's so fun. Um, and so I guess going back to the Amsterdam thing, I also wanted to talk about it because it seems like 
you really enjoy living in Amsterdam and you like I just love all your pictures of like you biking around Amsterdam and all of that kind of stuff so is there anything else you want to talk say about just living in Amsterdam in general oh it's it's yeah it's fantastic um I see <laughs> uh yeah it, it's it really it's kind of crazy I didn't realize how much New York didn't fit me until I found mm -hmm. Amsterdam and saw how much it did. You know, just the idea of being really aligned with the the city culture, um, even though you're still kind of the odd man out, um, and how much freedom that kind of, how much mental freedom and creativity, like space for creativity that gives you. When I feel supported in all these other ways in Amsterdam, and also, of course, by my fiance and friends here, it just gives that space for me to exhale, relax, mm -hmm. explore a little bit more, and discover the, the quieter sides of me. That kind of when you're in a state of, in a place that doesn't necessarily fit, those pain points are screaming at you that you can't even hear what's underneath. So mm -hmm. for me, I really found that it gives me that quiet and that, that calm. Yes. I love that so much. Um, for me, I've talked a lot about like having the sense of belonging, which I think is very similar and just like how much better you just feel with yourself when when you feel like you're like in the right space doing the right thing with the right people around you exactly yeah it really feels like home it's a uh, uh yeah it's it's really nice that i i feel every day so lucky to have happened to have found uh, uh my fiance and also to have built this kind of life over here i love visiting new york for sure <laughs> but it's and it's still home in its own way but it is yeah. it is a different feeling yeah yeah, I can totally relate. Um, because like, for me, Montana is still like, that's home. But I don't really have the desire to move back. Home. <laughs> it, it doesn't feel like the place where I belong. Yeah, even though it's the place I came from. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so there was something else in there. Oh, you you've talked a little oh, bit about it's, it's on, yeah. your Sorry. team. Um, <clears throat> Do you want to talk a little bit more about how that came to be and how your team operates? Because I think that's something that not a lot of designers have or at least talk about. And so it's it's interesting, I think. Yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned, when I first started, I was like, okay, what are my advantages? What are my disadvantages in this industry? And what do heavy? <laughs> um, and what what do I gain energy from doing myself? And what do I feel like it's just not for me, you know? And mm -hmm. so the first thing was first that I knew that math was going to be tough. And the way that my team grew is just really, um, really just kind of naturally. I was really lucky for that as well just other knitters that I connected with. And um, let's see, we have um, Olga, who's a ginger handcrafts on Instagram, who is uh, my pattern writer and grader. And she actually lives here in the Netherlands, which is also really nice. Uh, she lives in Utrecht and she is originally from Russia. And she's just so talented. We started working together because she wanted to test, she test knit uh, Brooklyn, a sweater of mine. And then she kind of came in with just the kind of edits that you just, you love to see on a test knit. Um, and I just love the way that she worked. Um, we decided to talk about, she was, she's trans, she translates patterns as well. And we decided to have, give it a go for, a, a um, one of our patterns. And just see if we can kind of come up with a template to kind of work from a style guide and see if we work together. And it's, it's, it's been great. She's really talented and super smart. And uh, I love working with her and seeing her point of view. So when we work together, I'll come with a design and any particular 
like specific things that I, I, I think should be important. And then we develop it together. And so she will say, I'll say what sizes and, and what, um, what yarn and come up with the, the idea. And also anything that's like, oh, it's really important that we use this kind of cast on or something like that. And she's like, oh, maybe we should shift it this way. So we do really develop it together. And then, um, Let's see. For some of my, for some of my work, as well, I've worked with a copywriter, Catherine uh, Micah, and she is Kasha Nitz, and that had we had found each other through uh, Araha Nitz, the Swatch Studio Circle, and we were actually partnered together. We found each other as a um, what are they called again? Uh, accountability partners to kind of just keep each other on track. And we did, I helped design her logo and she helped me with some writing. And then we were like, oh man, she, what she can do with words is just incredible. So a lot of the pattern romance for me, I think also partially, like maybe I didn't necessarily need to have it, but I just love to see her work and what she can come up with. I was, if I, if you asked me to, to write about now it's a little bit better but especially then if you asked me to write oh what was your inspiration i was like i wanted a pocket so i made a pocket like i can't really <laughs> can't really bring out the uh, and it's just like okay what, what was it about this sweater that that you liked and i was like well i wanted something i can travel in you can put your wallet your, your passport in there's like a pocket right there we're making our own clothes why don't we have pockets and she said uh she for brooklyn she made this incredible just description that really just hit the nail on the head and described the tuck stitches as um, the landing, landing, uh, uh, like the air, airplane landing strips, like uh, the, the lines on there. It was just gorgeous. So uh, she's someone that I've worked with in the past as well. And uh, a sample knitter, Yof Kao, who's uh, hand, um, handmade by Wonder Witch, and also Yof Kao on Instagram. She is just incredible. And so she works with me and Olga to also kind of give her input on, on how, as she's knitting it, how, uh, what she found a little bit difficult or what, you know, from a, from a beginner's perspective, she's also a teacher as well. So that really adds another dynamic to, to, to the final design. So she, she knits like lightning fast. And I met her through Cross and Woods, the yarn shop in The Hague. And Eloise had introduced me to Yof. And we really, really hit it off. She's just, yeah, ex extremely talented. She spins and dyes. And she gifted me some yarn that I'm weaving with right now. And she hand spun it and dyed it. Crazy. And uh, yeah, extremely, extremely talented. So just to see them work is is really great. And then for layout, I work with um, Jesslyn Stardis, who is um, a Jesslyn Illustrated uh, on Instagram. And she, we've kind of, found each other through another friend of mine who's a crochet designer, Heather Griffith, and um, HGDC Crochet. She did some illustration work with her. So Jess does the illustrations that I use for my schematics, and she also puts everything in layout. So we have a template that I give all the information afterwards, and she kind of puts it into, into the layout and is also kind of attentive to how it should be formatted. and. Yeah, so I think uh, I think that's and also um, for photography, I've worked with another knitter as well, Flavi. Um, I met through uh, Flaxfield Designs, uh, Rose, and she uh, she lo also lives in the Netherlands. Which I'm, yeah, it's also just so great to meet other other people who are living in the Netherlands that are knitters and um, have their own businesses in, the, in other parts of the industry. And mm -hmm. yeah, Flavi. So she's taken some of my photos, especially of uh, recent and upcoming upcoming designs. So all of this working with a team, not only do I have a little bit more space and some room to to pull out from the, you know, pixel by pixel adjustments, but also I get to to work with incredible people who I'm just in all of, awe of and just really truly enjoy um enjoy working with and just appreciate their expertise and however I can further support their side of the business, right? Because you see a lot of yarn dyers or knitwear designers and it's, uh, 
it's a lot of hats, but it's not the only way you can be in, in this industry. Yeah. And I, I think that that's super important to bring out there and also to kind of support them, um, support them in their businesses. Because if you don't really like all the rest of the things that come with it, then yeah, uh, sometimes people are a little bit more quiet about working with the team, but I'm just like, here, they're, they're <laughs> the best. And they, they, yeah, if they've got time. And oh, I also work with the social media uh, manager. So Lara Bell Social. I've recently started working with her. She's in the UK and she's awesome too. It's been, it's been fantastic working with her. Uh, she is, ex yeah. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're, uh, when you're planning out social media and you're doing a reel, especially, and you're like, okay, and then I'm going to like kick and then this is going to happen. And then all of a sudden I'm going to like put my makeup on and this, and it sounds really, really dumb when you say it yourself. Right. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, what am I doing? Like, oh, well, you know, you, the, the year you're born flashes in your eye and you're just like, sit down and shouldn't be doing reels. But when you work with Lara, she is awesome. And it's nice to have somebody else to talk to about that. That doesn't make you feel like really silly for doing these things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's nice to have her expertise and, and just kind of have a little bit more structure. Cause I don't know about you, but social media is the first thing to drop for me when things get kind of crazy. So just to have someone to really work out ideas with chat with actually make it fun. That's, 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 um, that's yeah. Worth yeah. it from the, yeah. Worth it, worth everything. So yeah, that's, that's my team. It's really, it's really been great growing this team really naturally finding everybody and, um, just, just loving the fact that, you know, uh, I, I get a chance to work with other people and it is investment. Um, but that's also kind of supported by the rest of my business. And I, and I also try to protect them as well. Like if I'm on a, on a super deadline and stuff like that, like that doesn't get passed down to them as much as possible. And I just try to, you know, um, yeah, try to provide them also a good working environment and hopefully, you know, we get to work together for longer. Yeah, I love that so much. And I love that when you create a team in general, um, any business, that you're really being more efficient about the work that's being done because everybody's doing the work that they enjoy and that they're good at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you mentioned, you know, so often entrepreneurs talk about how they have to wear all these hats. And to a certain extent, yes, that's true. But then there's also a lot that you can hire out. And so... Mm -hmm. Especially when the hats are getting overwhelming or not enjoyable. Um, yeah, and knitting is not known for being very fast. It. So, like, for actually doing things on the needles, like, takes a long time. And, you know, as a designer, too, I'm sure you're familiar, you're thinking of 17 different ideas before you get to the end of the row. Um, so. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do you want to also know. talk? <laughs> you want to also talk about your experience with teaching? Yeah. Um, hmm. uh, it's actually been a while since I've taught a class because I, we've, we went to, at, in December, we had left to New York for two months while we, our house was being renovated. Hey, MJ. And we... I, I think the last class I taught was maybe in November. And so then we just moved back into our house after renovations. We were like hopping around for a while. Um, but yeah, I was preparing for the knit stars class. That's also a sort of teaching and I love it. I think a, a part of, part of the user experience design things are just like the puzzle of, of teaching is dissecting the same topic in multiple different ways and from different angles. And if people still have questions, that's great. Cause then it just means like, okay, what's a new approach? How can we, how can we get to this a different way? So I really enjoy that challenge and understanding how people best digest information and take things in on the needles and also virtual versus face to face and how that, how, how other people learn and to be that, 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 I guess, facilitator to, to learning and to, 
getting that aha moment, getting super, being excited and providing a environment where everyone's just having fun. That's, that's really exciting to me. I like the idea of we're going to have a great time and we're going to learn something too. You know, mm -hmm. instead of, instead of just, okay, you're going to leave here with this, this, and this, you will, but, um, you're going to connect with other knitters along the way and learn something new and surprise yourself. Likely it's just, it's a whole, it's a whole package. And I think that that's one of the skills that really means the most to me throughout this whole journey, because it means that I get to connect to the to connect to other people the most. And, and, um, my first teaching opportunity was through Vogue, as I mentioned, uh, Gabby and Aaron had reached out to me for uh, teaching at the the 2020 Vogue. I think it was the 10th anniversary event, was it? I don't know. But it was my first time going to Vogue. And I was teaching five sold out classes and a lecture uh, back to back to back to back. <laughs> And it was the best kind of crazy. I mean, I remember just preparing for those classes and everyone who was involved in helping me, like all my friends who did the dry runs, all my friends who, who supported me were like, oh yeah, like, you know, maybe this is a tip you can teach or, um, yeah, of course, Beth, um, Erin and Gabby there as support, some of the teachers that were there. I remember I used to take, uh, I had taken one of Bristol Ivy's classes and she was the first person that I saw walking into the teacher, into the teacher's room. She was like, <laughs> I'm so glad to see you here. Come here. And she gave me a big hug. And that was like my first entrance into Vogue. And that, that will always mean the world to me. Um, yeah, it, it, that was, um, yeah. So that was, that was my first kind of dive into teaching. I had done just a few more teachings in person before everything moved into virtual. And then it's like, a, uh, like my first, Jam teaching virtual is really, really stressful. I was like, I don't even know if I can do this. It was like one long run on sentence because I didn't know how to handle the silence, uh, silence and 40 something people in a room. So it was, uh, that was definitely a learning, uh, a learning, uh, a bit of an adjustment. But after a while, yeah, teaching virtual is, I think, one of my, one of my favorite things. I think I might, I enjoy, of course, it's been so long since I've talked to in person, but, um, just the fact that you can tune in from anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. like we are here. Yes. And uh, feel some sort of connected, but not have to have like, you know, uh, also like a weekend is quite exhausting and quite a lot, you know, something you have to prepare for also accessibility wise, whether you can actually travel or afford the like tickets and all that comes with the events and stuff just to, to know that virtually we can reach so many more people because of that is yeah. also something I really like to support. And it feels like, it feels like even more of a special connection. If you're letting my voice boom through your house, like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I love, I love just all the virtual stuff in general, the, the greater opportunity for connections just in so many other areas that we want to have mm -hmm. otherwise. I think it's so cool. <laughs> Yeah, totally. So um, knitting or not knitting, teaching, was that something that you'd ever like considered before or like did you it kind of just fall into your lap and you were surprised or? I've taught some places before, like, I don't know, here and there for, I don't know, the 37 clubs that I used to be in, <laughs> in <laughs> high school and college or volunteering. I had taught teaching. Mm -hmm. I had taught some music for a while and to kids. Um, so the idea wasn't super scary to me in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, I had thought about it, but I, I, I think I, I, to be honest, when Vogue had reached out, I, I hadn't thought about it. I was, <laughs> I hadn't thought about it then. Um, I did one of those, like, I'm sorry, did, me? Did you come from <laughs> Instagram? I was like, wait, it says my name there. So I guess that's, that must be me. Um, they, 
they yeah I, I'm so grateful to them for taking a chance also on me and I think they also really spot it and believe it and support you um, in so many different ways Vogue for if you're interested in teaching and they're really really there to help organize the class to help you see other teachers and try it out um, and also technical like the the gear that you need as well really help and support that so in that respect um i felt really comfortable taking on something like that knowing that they were there and i had a lot of people to reach out to they also connected me with other teachers to ask their their advice so uh i hadn't thought about it at the time i think it was one of those like i described i recently described uh these events where you know you get this opportunity and you didn't see it coming at all as, um, you know, in Mario Kart, you get the mushroom and it like, you know, like the mushroom power up and you go like, so, so much like the accelerator. That's kind of what, what I felt like. And so, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about it at all, but I was definitely open to it and not super nervous because I really did feel, feel supported. I love that. Love that. Um, so I just had to, I had to ask because like growing up for the longest time, I was sure I was going to be a teacher. Um, really? And that time I was like, you know, like what I knew was education system teaching. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then the last couple of years of high school, I changed my mind and I went into engineering. Um, but throughout this whole business thing, you know, like just continuing to like think about my strengths and all this stuff, it kept coming up like, I'm good at teaching and coaching kind of stuff and I enjoy it. But I discovered that I didn't love teaching knitting. <laughs> this was not a fit. Um, but then of course, last year I finally realized like what I love is teaching and coaching around business stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that's when it was finally like, oh, this finally makes sense. Like how it all connects. But it, awesome. it was a journey getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As 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 it is, yes. you know. I think I'm also at a point right now. Um, to be honest, like a bit of just uncertain on where to go next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's almost too many options in terms of you know. And then there's some things that I'm like, okay, I'm not really getting a strong push or a pull in one direction or the other. And I, mm -hmm. and like, I can't really do any testing or any kind of idea to see, to see what will, and you never know what's going <laughs> to really be, what's mm -hmm. going to pay off. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's so much work that goes into anything you do in this industry or any, mm -hmm. you know, any, like there's always work, <laughs> mm -hmm. whatever, whatever you're doing, whatever you're working on. Um, and so Right now, I'm at a point where, okay, do I go towards uh, teaching and in what way? Or, you know, I don't have, you know, because of all the teaching that has come out of nowhere, I don't have a huge catalog of patterns. So I'm like, okay, but I also kind of want to fill that out. And, you know, it's just uh, uh, an ebook, right? Like, then you just get these like random things that are thrown at you, like, oh, why don't you do that also? Or, oh, or set up a Patreon or, Twitch, I don't know, like all these options now, um, hey Laura, that you can, that you can kind of go into. Mm -hmm. And it does take trying, going in one direction and taking note of whether it works for you or if it doesn't. And then hopefully you end up in a place like you where it all works together and kind of comes together in a place that really feels right. To be mm -hmm. honest, right now I'm in one of those in-between places where I'm like, I don't know if I should go left, I don't know if I should go right, don't know what to invest in, and um, and uh, yeah, hoping for 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 some sort of feedback or just choose a place and go, and then just take note, and hopefully it'll all wrap up together nicely. <laughs> yeah, something that I found to be like an amazing amount of encouragement. Like a year and a half ago, I took this course with Nicole Walters, and she said it's okay to change your mind. You know, like so often we feel like, and I thought of this too, when you're talking about your dad starting all these different businesses and stuff. Um, so often we feel like we have to go one direction and stay with it. And so it makes the decision process so much harder because it's like, I have to do this thing in order to actually be 
successful, I have to stay with it. And what are people going to think if I go in a completely different direction, all this stuff. Um, but the way she described it is when you change your mind, you've just making a more informed decision. <laughs> you, you, ha you have mm -hmm. new information that you didn't have before. And it doesn't say anything about how good or bad you are <laughs> as a person. Yeah. And also it, it's, I mean, I've changed, I've changed industry. Like I studied pre-med and bio. I worked in ambulances for five years, uh, volunteering as an EMT. Uh, I went to do experience design. I worked for a meditation company for a while. Uh, just, and I always felt like a kind of jack of all, jack of all trades, but master of none. But now if you kind of flip that, I feel like, okay, I've brought, as Prue was asking, like a lot mm -hmm. of that experience from user, uh, user experience design into my work now. Um, I'm not saving any lives. So my <laughs> free a degree doesn't do anything for me, but you know, little experiences also and changing your mind mm -hmm. and taking that along with you and not just kind of scrapping everything is really powerful as well and what makes it's what makes your your product and delivery and your your personality and your experience and the community that you build different than anybody else's so i do see it as a strength but i still wish it would help me <laughs> figure out what to do next <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah it is um just i guess going back a little bit to what we were just talking about you know like I feel like you, you know you're talking about the EMT stuff like being totally different but it still does totally change who you are and how you perceive the world and that yeah. is like so powerful as a business owner like mm -hmm. I mean especially for us who are the face of our business <laughs> like that, yeah. that, that that is so much of what our business is and so you know, all, all of those experiences, I think, are so valuable. But. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, we're already almost to an hour. Um, yeah, that's really right. I haven't even, like, looked at my list of questions I was going uh, to ask you. Well, that's a good sign, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <clears throat> I did want to touch, I always like to touch a little bit more on life outside of designing and knitting, because... I think that's something that we don't share as much as we could on social media and things like that, or it's hard to know how to share it, what to share. <laughs> um, but designers are people too. They're not just designers. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you enjoy outside of designing and knitting, uh, what you like to do with free time? If you yeah, might. right. <laughs> um, Oh, I, I mean, I love spending time with my fiance, obviously. Uh, he's, he, he's wonderful. He's fantastic. And, you know, making up silly songs and, you know, doing, you know, uh, we were just cooking together. We just made homemade dumplings for the first time. And uh, yeah, so we, we enjoy cooking together. I like, you know, going out with friends. Um, we, I'm, really like, I guess, going out to restaurants and, you know, trying out different foods and game nights. We have game nights with our friends quite often, uh, festivals, clubs, dancing for sure. Uh, definitely a night owl partier. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I also, I don't know. I mean, I like, oh yeah, well, yeah, weaving. Uh, I guess I was trying to think like outside of the fiber <laughs> realm, but I guess in my free time, yeah, I'm a, I'm a weaver. Uh, I don't know if you can see my, there. Um, but uh, yeah, I think cooking, weaving, dancing, friends, uh, cycling through Amsterdam. And yeah, lately I've been really, I found this uh, YouTube channel that does Cantonese uh, recipes and so I've really been loving connecting with my culture and my family a little bit more because a lot of those recipes weren't passed down to me or they weren't written down and so I kind of just wrote it off as lost in my childhood and something I could only get at a restaurant or from other family members but not anything that would come out of my kitchen you know but uh, I found this YouTube channel made with Lao that explains it all super well and from a 
talented chefs. So that's something that I really enjoy doing. And that's something I'm working on now is, is focusing on building my skills, cooking, and hopefully, you know, passing that on one day and just making food for friends. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Really okay. I will ask you about your designs in just a second. But first, I want to go back to Knit Stars. And you can share about that, how that happened, the experience, all the excitement of it. <laughs> I got an email, and I thought it was a promotional one. And then I read it. And I'm like, again, it was like, oh, wait, they're saying my name. Is there. <laughs> and they're like asking if I want to be a part of it. What? That's crazy. So I, um, I had uh, received the email and was super excited about the idea of being part of Stars. Again, the talk about accessibility and just the, the quality of the production and just how it transports you to other places. And you really get to learn at your own pace with, with teachers around the world about everything. That was super exciting um, to see as a knitter but to be a part of it is just an absolute honor. It's just incredible. So um, my my class is on textured slip stitches. And it dives into different kinds of building on different kinds of slip stitches and how you can kind of sub those out. So the the pattern is a oh wait, I have one here. I have here. No, one second. I should... Um the pattern is a slip stitch cowl. This is the, the basics pattern. And this is like the single cowl that you can kind of just already start to see the simple, simple slip stitches and how they interact with each other. And there's an advanced cowl as well. And I love slip stitches and just the depth and the range of them and how you can really create such incredible textures. And then when also when you add in color, it's crazy. There's so many options for slip stitches. So I was really happy to develop the idea with them and that they were, they were cool with me doing slip stitches because I know other people have done some before. Um, and yeah, I think that um, we, we filmed our, our uh, my, my, my class on end of last year, uh, end of last month. And there's a lot in there. Like <laughs> we go into each stitch, how to do it, how how it um, changes in terms of color. So I have multiple swatches from each one to see how different bases and different color changes the texture and not good or bad, but just arm everybody, arm the students with the range. And then they can choose for themselves based on what they have and based on their preferences, what they like. So what is a single ply going to do to, to this pattern? And do you want a little bit more of a busier, busier vibe or do you want it to be like uh, pronounced and have, have the, the slip stitches shine? So we're uh, just giving everyone a little bit more of that in-depth knowledge of, uh, or in-depth perspective on how uh, slip stitches work and how different yarns and bases can, can affect them. So, yeah, and it was it was really fun. So I think also, like also for my little lifestyle piece in there, we went to a nightclub, went out with my friends, had some drinks, I was dancing. So it was also a totally flip side of things. Went to a uh, plan store and also riding around Amsterdam. The film crew was sitting in a uh, in a buck feet in a one of the the bikes with a bucket and filming behind me, which is just crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was really a really fantastic experience. So that's coming out in October. It'll be available for. October, um, the the entire season, and the lineup is just awesome. Uh, it's really wonderful getting to know the other the other knit stars along the way, and uh, yeah, it's been an, it's been a really incredible experience. So I'm excited to do a lot more with slip stitches, and um, yeah, uh, definitely a lot more coming in that direction. <laughs> yeah, and you collaborated with Sonder Yarn, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, this, this, this gorgeous, this gorgeous yarn right here is from Sonder Yarn. And um, I had um, been following them. And 
really just love their color palette. And just to be able to see, they have every color that they have that they offer on every base that they offer, which is just wild. So I love that idea. And we developed this custom colorway called Salt and Stone um, <laughs> for, for, the, for the class. So it's just kind of like steely, teal, like ocean expired, but you still see a lot of the texture. So it's still light enough to pick up on that and create a really nice shadow. So the the yarn is exclusive from Sonder, but they you should just go check them out. They're at Sonder Yarn Co. on Instagram, and it's just um, a an absolute treasure to work with uh, Melissa and Tanya and get to know them along the way too. Yeah, thanks for running me. Sorry, I'm like <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. It's yeah. just um, yeah, it's just has been a wild couple of months preparing for this and and uh, getting to meet everyone and talking to Gigi and getting her advice on things and also having a bit of, having some things I had in the back burner really get whipped into shape and really have a, you know, sometimes you need that deadline, right? <laughs> yes, I love it so much. Um, and it was, it was so fun to see like the announcements come out because I yeah. talked to you a few months ago about having you now Mm -hmm, I had no mm -hmm. idea, of course, that you were going to be in Knit Stars or anything. So it was just, <laughs> it was fun to, like, have somebody that, like, I've actually, like, talked with and, like, kind of know as a Knit Star. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine how I feel. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Um, Hi, Kathleen. Yeah. Um, and... mm. Is there anything else you want to say? Go ahead. Um... No, it comes out in October. Um, keep an eye out. Check out the lineup. You can go to the link in my bio and and see um, see who else is in it. Star if you haven't already checked it out, and uh, there will be um, it will be available again for in, in October. And you can see a lot more of the sneak peeks of of everyone's uh, everyone's workshops. So yeah, keep an eye. It's super exciting, and you can also get the exclusive colorway yarn, which is stunning. Yeah, I'm so excited for you and everything that's been happening. So um, let's go ahead and dive into your designs because it would be silly to end this live without actually talking about your designs. Um, do you have some of your samples with you? I do. I do. I have, um, well, I'll start off with uh, one that everyone can get right now, which is uh, free on my newsletter. It's this, uh, it's a slip stitch a mosaic hat called Velsin and you get it it lands right in your inbox when you sign up for my newsletter if you are so interested in that and it is a super cozy and um Camaro snuff mug hat I absolutely love it it's yeah super quick knits very chill and yeah you can kind of get a little dip into mosaic if you've never done it before and just trying to spread the slip stitch love over here. <laughs> so this is, if you sign up for my newsletter, it's called Belson and it's really textured cozy hat. And I have a, a pattern that's actually releasing in, on June 10th. Uh, they are called Hilo. They are sock pattern. It's a sock pattern actually inspired by Dutch brickwork. Oh. And um, yeah, they're just these little color cuties. I have them. They're also in. Um, they're also in a angle version, a mid calf length version as well. And yeah, super fun, addicting knit. And they are coming out in on June tenth. They're written as I mentioned before, uh, toe up and cuff down. Oh, I should also mention there. Uh, one of my patterns is not toe up and cuff down because that was for a special collaboration, and I was talking about the. Uh, uh, user experience before, but it is getting updated. So I'm hoping to also bring everything up. You know how it's like to go through the back catalog and trying to get everything up to what things are now or trying yeah. to get updates and stuff. So yeah. I, I did <laughs> misspeak, misspeak there. But um, yeah, so these are Hello. They are made in uh, Rosa Pomar Mondim. And they are just super cozy great for any boots that you want also for any kind of cuties 
really chill, uh, easy to memorize uh, color work section. Yeah, they're just super cute and I'm excited for them to come out. I've had them for, I these have been knit for almost a year now. They, they, they've been, they've been waiting for a very long time to see. Yeah. <laughs> to utilize. So, um, and the, I can tell like just looking at them that they're cozy. Yeah. They're super cozy. The yarn is fantastic. I love, um, Rosa Pomar's yarn. And I actually went to go visit the, the shop in person and that's when I had picked it up. My father lives in Lisbon. And uh, I was visiting him and got a chance to go and got pretty much like one of every yarn that they have just to three of every yarn that they have just to kind of swatch and play around. And this came pretty quickly, but I just been sitting on it because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what's also coming out soon is a, a single public or a my self-release version of of uh, Rafi Marcus, which was a collaboration with Black Isle Yarns. So this is in Black Isle Yarn. How can I think you pronounce it like that? And it's a tuck stitch cowl, a tuck stitch double wrap cowl. And it will be, a, it's available with the, the update in a child's size as well. So this is a child size so and it's cute. nice kind of cozy for, yeah, just kind of throwing on. I'm a big, I, I really love cowls. That's like, that's kind of my jam. I think it's just so easy to just throw it on. It kind of sits, it sits nicely. However, you, you don't have to kind of like style it that much. So most of my patterns are, are cowls. And speaking of, this is the one that is my very first one that was released three years today. It is the chickpea cowl. So this is a tuck stitch cowl with welts in between to kind of give it a little bit of more texture. And uh, so the tuck stitch from Nancy Marchand is, that book is just my favorite book. Uh, I think it'll always be my favorite book. And uh, I created, used one of her tuck stitches here and put some welts in between and that was my first design. So this is what I wear actually pretty much every day. <laughs> I love this. This is in Long Island Yarn and Farm Yarns in their alpaca and it's actually a uh, uh, alpaca farm that is 40 minutes less than from my house that I grew up in. So <laughs> a little bit of home with me as well. Yeah, it's so fun. Yeah, so that's her I think, oh, I also have, do I have time for another one? I have another one. So this <laughs> is a uh, Kessel and I also, I don't know, I don't know where my hairland socks are, but my, my, Best-selling pattern is Hearland socks, and their textures. And you, you have them. Oh yeah, you you haven't had them on needles yet, but <laughs> they are they are uh, written for uh, ankle length as well as mid mid calf. They are super textured seed stitch, and they have kind of a cinched midsection to kind of really keep it on snug, and a little ankle tab so that you have is the cinched, cinched in part because I think it's going to fit so well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really does. It does hug your foot. And then the back has a has an ankle tab as well to kind of, you know, prevent from any chafing and stuff. So a little bit of a sportier look, but with some texture and, and you know, hand knit. So this one's also Kessel. I just got also kind of creases in the night because they're in the house. It's a crossed stitch brioche that I also learned from Nancy Marchand in her class. <laughs> Uh, a scarf in Lani Vendole in their appearance of wool. And this is just the best for, it's the best yarn for fall in general, but a super cozy kind of unisex scarf pattern that, um, yeah, uh, is a really mindless knit. You're pretty much just doing straight brioche in the middle and then you kind of go into these cross stitches in between for a little bit of interest. So yeah, that's also another way that I kind of like to look at the experience of like the user experience, not only of experiencing the pattern, but how you're going to interact with the piece itself mm -hmm. and kind of imagining, all right, well, you, is this for kind of like spring walks on the beach or, you know, something that you throw on right when the sun goes down on a, on a, a fall day kind of things like that. 
So kind of imagine in what way it's going to be used. And that's how I kind of build the, the design as well as choose the yarns that kind of go with it. But yeah. Yeah. That's all that I have with here. Yeah. So the, how do you, her, Herlin, Herlin, Herlin. Herlin. <laughs> socks. That is how I actually first found you. I don't remember oh. who in the world shared it, but when it first was released, I saw it in a bunch of stories or at least some stories a few times. Oh. That's nice. So I found you in the first place. And oh, so cool. I had in my mind when I uh, decided I was going to have you here to talk today um, that I would at least have the socks cast on part way through, <laughs> but it hasn't happened oh, still. <laughs> you've also been in holiday mode. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're somewhere in that bag over there, and I did not dug them out. I don't know where they are. But I also have Herlin mittens that have an inner lining as mm -hmm. well. And those are really great for, for the fall. I had Herlin socks. I um, I was just completely blown away by the response to them. And yeah, it means a lot that you know, you heard about me through them. And yeah, they're 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 nice little cuties. Yeah. Um, do you also real quick want to share the story behind that, that you, you'd emailed me, I shared it in one of the posts that we talked about, but you weren't going to design socks and then something happened. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I, I actually went to Unravel in the UK and I had bought, I had just started my first sock, like a few, like my first real sock I'd done in high school too, uh, a few weeks before. I was like, I am never designing socks. That's just not happening. So I'm going to go to Unravel and I'm going to buy all the sock yarn there is because that just means it's only for me. <laughs> I'm not going to design with it. It's like out of bounds for the work, for the work like realm. And then a few weeks later after that, uh, with, you know, sitting next to my pile of sock yarn, I got an email from Jimmy Beans Wool uh, asking if I would like to design for their sock club. And then that's kind of how, that's how, that's how Her uh, Herlin had started. And I was like, well, I'm not going to say no to that. So I guess <laughs> I'm a sock designer. And I, yeah, again, I was really grateful for them, uh, to them for, you know, taking a chance on me for my first sock design. And it went, it went super well. And they, again, kind of gave me guidance with it. And it was really nice to, to, yeah, work on such a small scale and, you know, kind of also figure out what kind of toe I like, what kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, heel was best and just enter the realm of sock knitting in general. And then coming up with a design that people really liked. I'm so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. Love it so much. Well, we've already gone over quite a bit. So thank you for sticking around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Yeah, so how can folks find you online and your patterns? So you can find me online. Uh, I'm mostly uh, on Salt and Stone Knits everywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm Salt and Stone Knits everywhere. So on Ravelry as well as Instagram here, you can find me at Salt and Stone Knits. And if you sign up for my newsletter, you can get a 20% off of my uh, discount on my store, as well as the Velson hat that I mentioned. So um, a lot of kind of sneak peeks and for um like special release discounts are on my on my newsletter so yeah that's pretty much how you can find me i have i don't have cl classes signed up yet or started uh, on the schedule yet but probably somewhere in the fall i'll pick up again so, perfect yeah. thank you so much for joining us and for thank you so much. who joined live thank you it was fun chatting yeah. um yeah, thanks so and much didn't catch the whole thing the replay will be available so it'll be up in a little bit all right thank, thank you. you i hope you have hope a good night everybody. thank you you too <laughs> talk to you later bye everyone